How many of you guys who are parents have played board games with you? Then I am more about the game than you'd like to think or admit. You might be better people than I am, but there's certain things that I actually care more about than I would kind of like to think than I really care kind of a lot. Like I kind of wanted to just tell my kids, you know, you guys pick your colors and mom will just be really left over, but I actually really care. I want to be blue. I really, really like being blue. I tried not to tell my kids that, but it was really hard to keep it a secret because when I was little, I played board games with my dad and my dad is colorblind, he can only see two colors. He can see blue and he can see yellow. So every time we played, I was blue and he was yellow. So when I get ready to play, blue is me. So whenever somebody else is blue, I feel like, you know, I'm not me. And I really don't like to be yellow because that's my dad's color. So I can't be yellow because that one is not me. And I don't particularly like red, so I can hang with almost anything, but if the only color that is left is red, then it actually does kind of bother me. I just, I, to me, red, bright red, not like all reds, but just bright fire engine red, it's kind of abrasive, it doesn't feel good, and I don't want that one to be me. Um, you guys play Monopoly? Or used to play Monopoly? Or play Monopoly with your kids? Um, you know, there's, there's all these different playing pieces, right? And I always like to be the Scotty dog. That was, that was me. When, we, when Dad and I played Monopoly, I was the Scotty dog. He was the car, or there was, a man on a, there was a man on a horse. Sometimes he would be the man on the horse. Which, do you guys have one you like better? Is there one of these that's you? And it doesn't feel quite as good if you don't get to be that one. And you got maybe a second choice and a third choice. But if all your favorites are taken, it's just not really quite the same, is it? Um, you know, and then you get to role-playing games or video games, and it gets much more elaborate, sort of who's you, right? Um, but, but it's always sort of that one is me. Um, when I was a kid, we used to do this sometimes with like movies and books and stuff because I'd get together with my friends and we would act out the story. And I had... Uh, a best friend named Jenny, and we used to get together all the time, and we pretended the story from Escape to Witch Mountain, not the movie, but the book. The book was a million times better. But we would pretend the, the story from Escape to Witch Mountain, and I was always Tony, and she was always Tia, and if we had switched characters, it just would have ruined the whole game, right? There's, there's one that's me. And sometimes we even do that just if we're reading something or we're watching a movie. We identify with a certain character. Um, well, on our, our one-year journey through the Bible, we are reading the Exodus story this week. And by the way, if you want to read along with us, there's instructions in your bulletin how you can get a hold of the, the daily readings. Or you can always just come on Sundays and follow the big story that way. Um, but the Exodus story is a foundational narrative for Israelite identity. Um, and through this story of the Exodus, God communicated to this new people that he was forming how he wanted them to think about themselves. And it also communicates really important information to us as followers of Jesus, those of us who have joined Jesus in what's often called a new Exodus, also communicates with us about how we should think about ourselves and how we should relate to others. Um, just a brief review of where we've been. Two weeks ago, we saw how God promised Abraham that he was going to use him and his descendants to form a new nation and to bless all of the peoples of the earth and communicated that he was launching his redemption plan for humanity. And then last week, we saw how Abraham's descendants, the sons of Israel, were so broken that they actually sold their own brother, Joseph, as a slave. And at the same time, we saw how in spite of human beings' ill intentions, that they were actually fulfilling God's plan, that they were actually forwarding God's rescue plan for the earth. Um, they, were, they, were per, they were part of God's plan to save the whole family from starvation by providing them a temporary home in Egypt. So now we pick up 400 or so years later, and the situation of Joseph's family, the Israelites in Egypt, has completely changed. 
there's a new pharaoh, and this new pharaoh has made the Israelites slaves, and has started to subject them to forced labor. Now, at, at this point in the story, Israel is not yet a nation. They're just a bunch of slaves with some common ancestry. In the world's terms, they're nobodies. They've been a displaced people for longer, for more generations, not longer, for they have been a displaced people for more generations than their ancestors lived in Canaan. Three generations people lived in Canaan. It's been more generations than that since they've been in Egypt. And Abraham had come from Haran before that and Ur before that. And at this point, they have no significant ties to either of those places. Um, now, they've been displaced for so long, they don't, they don't have a homeland to go to. And not only that, but they've become slaves. And... Um, this week's message is called The Exodus, Never Forget. Um, this week and next, we're going to see how God took a ragtag group of oppressed laborers, set them free from slavery, formed them into a nation, and gave them a special identity in him. Now, having been slaves set free by God is a central part of this identity. You know, scripture exhorts Israel over and over and over and over again to never forget where they came from. Never forget. Over and over again, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And this is not, never forget means, a different, means different things to different people. It's a phrase that's, that's been repeated over the last many years in the U.S. You know, quite a bit. And it means different things to different people. And it can be used to mean never forget the atrocities that have been done to us. Never forget the ways that we have been wronged. And this tends to lead toward hate, toward fear, and toward the propagation of more violence. But never forget here, as we're going to talk about it today, as we see the exhortation over and over again to the Israelites, means a different thing. It means never forget that you have been the recipients of God's extravagant grace. Never forget how incredibly you have been blessed. Never forget that you were slaves, that you were homeless, that you were refugees. And when you look at the people around you, when you see the poor, when you see the lost, when you see the displaced and the downtrodden, when you see everyone who is alone, I want you to look at those people and say, that one is me. To remember where you came from and say, those are my people. And I want you to treat those people accordingly. So we're going to talk about this story and how this plays out in the life of the, the Israelite people. And we're also going to talk about Jesus and how he brought about a new exodus, setting us free from another form of slavery and adopting us into the family of God and confirming on us the same identity with the same admonition, never forget. Never forget where you came from and treat others accordingly. So the big idea this morning is this. The Bible's numerous commands to remember the Exodus exhort the people of God to never forget where we came from, that we have been the recipients of God's amazing grace, and to extend that grace to others. So today, as we look at the Exodus, we're going to pay attention to the formation of Israel's identity and ours, and we're actually going to do that through the lens of three celebrations commemorating the Exodus. Um, so we're going to look at each one of these celebrations and what it is that they mean. And before we do that, let me just take a moment to pray for us. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence today. Lord, thank you that you have a call in our lives that's bigger than ourselves. Thank you for your incredible mercy, for your incredible goodness to us. Thank you for making us into a new people. And God, would you show us how to be the people that you've called us to be? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So in our story about the Israelite people in Egypt, the oppression at this point has become so bad that Pharaoh's deeply worried about rebellion. And he's trying to work the people to exhaustion so that they will not have the energy to rebel. And then he also starts killing all, off all of their sons. So this is, this is a genocide. The, the idea here is that the next generation will not have a fighting force. And the generation after that will all have Egyptian fathers. So this is a, meant to be the end of a people group. Um, and God finally decides enough is enough. And that it's time to fulfill the promise that has been made to Abraham to settle his descendants in the land of Canaan. And so he sends the prophet Moses to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And he sends a series of plagues on Egypt to demonstrate his power, both to the Egyptians and to Israel, and to facilitate their release. And where we pick up, God has spoken to Moses that there will be one last plague. And after that, Pharaoh is going to let the people go. And he gives them very specific instructions for how to prepare for their departure. And the fascinating part to me about this narrative is that actually already in the instructions for how to prepare for the escape are also instructions for how to keep the annual celebrations that will remember this escape. The command to celebrate this escape annually is embedded right in the description of how the escape is going to happen in the first place. So we're going to read from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So this is a big deal. He's saying your entire calendar is going to be defined around the events that are about to happen. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So they're going to take some of the blood of this lamb. They're going to put it on the door frames of their houses. And when, when God comes through and strikes down the firstborn, they're going to be passed over. Now, three celebrations come out of this event, but the first two are so closely related that we're going to treat them as if they're one celebration, and that is the, the Passover and the Festival of the Unleavened Bread. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about those two things. I want to read the, the, the verses that follow that describe these two things. Celebrate the Festival of Unleavened Bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread without yeast, from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. So the Passover refers to the sacrifice of the lamb and the feast on the night before the departure. And then the festival of unleavened bread refers to the week of eating only bread that does not have yeast, only a, a flat bread. Um, so the Israelites made bread without yeast because there was no time to allow the bread to rise because they were imminently leaving. They could not wait for their bread to rise. And so they made bread without yeast and they ate this heavy meal of lamb to sustain them on their journey and they're to eat it quickly, dressed and ready to go while they're packing to leave because in the morning it's going to be go time. And so as we talk this morning about the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, I want to talk about just a few, a few different things and we're going to have these same four categories for each of the 
three festivals. So God says, remember this night. Remember your hurried departure. Remember the passing over of the Israelite homes and the death of the firstborn. So what God was doing was he was passing judgment on Egypt for all of their evil practices. But the problem was the Israelites were not innocent. The Israelites are also wrongdoers, sinners like you and me. And so if God's judgment was going to pass through, it, the Israelites were going to go down along with the Egyptians, just as if God were to, to sweep through this room right now. And the lamb's blood on the doorposts was a sign to cover them. So the Passover celebration is a celebration of God's mercy. It says, God's judgment came. We stood condemned, but God spared us. God spared our sons for no other reason than his great love for us and his mercy. Uh, and so... And so as the, the Israelite people are commanded to celebrate the Passover, it's remember that God spared your lives. And it's celebrated by eating the lamb and the unleavened bread. And there's also an exhortation that goes with this. Never forget that your life was spared for no other reason than God's grace. Israel to is to live as a people who have been bought back from death. And so there's this exhortation in the celebration itself to never forget that you were dead, but now you're alive. Now, in the short term, this calls the people to a response which is basically just absolute loyalty. It is, you know, this is the God, I am the God who saved your life. You owe me your very lives. Be faithful to me, right? And, and God gives the, the same command to us who are in Jesus, right? You owe God your very lives. You know, devote your very lives to God, right? But the full implications of the Passover can't really be fully understood except in light of the cross. You know, just like the Israelites, every one of us, you know, we, we stand guilty. If God's judgment were to sweep through this room right now, not one of us would survive on our own merit. Okay. And it turns out that a lamb can't really die in the place of a human being. It turns out that a human being actually can't really die in the place of another human being. But Jesus, as, God's, as God made flesh, could and did and all of us who come under the covering of his blood are spared. I want to skip ahead to the New Testament for a minute. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So like Israel, we owe our very lives to God. We are those who were once dead and are now alive. We are those who once stood condemned because of our misdeeds, and yet we have been forgiven. Now, I don't know about you, but before I knew Jesus, I actually felt dead. You know, some people don't. Some people you know, feel pretty good about their lives, and then they find out about Jesus, and they get really excited because this is even better. And I didn't even know any of this stuff. For me... I was definitely consciously aware of being dead. Um, and I felt that way, and I talked about myself that way. And I struggled for many, many years with very serious depression. And when I think about what it felt like to be depressed, I think about the, the, the story, the never-ending story. If you guys have either read or watched that, and there's this nothing that's just creeping over the world, and things just blank out. And that's what depression was like for me. It was like this just creeping emptiness that seemed like it was taking over everything. It was nothing, and it was awful. And ever since I've known Jesus, I've 
never felt that way again in my life. Never felt like that. Every once in a while, I get this tiny little glimpse. I have a moment where I have a memory of what it used to feel like. And when I feel that in my body, it terrifies me. And I find myself immediately reacting with, no, make it go away. God, never, ever let me feel like that ever again. I don't even want to remember what it used to feel like. And then I think, no, but wait. No, actually, God, never let me forget. Never let me forget what that felt like. Because I don't ever want to get to a place where I start to take you for granted. I don't ever want to get to a place where I assume that the good things that I have now were always mine. I want to remember where it was that I came from. Now, we only see this foreshadowed in the Old Testament. We have to go to the New Testament to see God's message to us. Where God says to us, in that place of memory, where you remember where you came from, when you see the sins of others, when you're wronged by others, and not just then, right? <laughs> it wasn't all just a long time ago. <laughs> you know, that one is a sinner just like me, just like I still am today. And it's only by, by grace alone that I, that I will live through God's judgment and treat this other person accordingly. This is why in Luke chapter 6, we read, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. The message here is that sinners are your people. Forgive them. Because it would be utter and complete hypocrisy for us to receive God's grace for ourselves and not extend that same grace to someone else. We're going to look at a, a second commemoration. The second commemoration of the Exodus that we're going to look, like, to look at is the redemption of the firstborn. And we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 13. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In the days to come, when your children ask you, what does this mean? Say to them, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. And this is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. So when I make you into a nation, remember these events down through every generation. Sacrifice every firstborn animal in memory of the fact that God struck down all of the firstborn of Egypt and redeem all of your firstborn sons. The Hebrew word here is pidyon, which means ransom. It's pay the price to set someone free. Um, we, don't really, we don't really have a concept of that kind of here in the United States today. I think the closest thing that we can imagine is like a pawn shop, honestly. And most of us, have, most of us haven't been to a, a pawn shop, but we've seen people in movies. We kind of know what it is, right, that you could take something that belongs to you and you can give it to the people at the pawn shop and then it will give you money right? But you might want that thing back. You might sell a piece of jewelry that's really precious to you, and you want it back. So you, so you, you hope that you will get enough money that you could buy back the thing that you pawned, right? So, so this is kind of the concept, only this is with people. You're going to buy back the, the, the sons that would otherwise stand condemned before the Lord. So the Israelites are going to pay a price to set their sons free from death in memory of the fact that God saved their sons. This is actually, in fact, what Mary and Joseph were doing at the temple when they brought Jesus to the temple and he was prophesied over as a baby. Um, this also refers to God's redemption of the whole of the Israelite people, not just the redemption of those firstborn sons, but of the whole people from slavery. 
When God called Moses in the beginning, he actually uses a different word for redeem. It's a, a synonym. A synonym. Um, and we're not going to go into that today, but if you're getting the emails, there's a few notes on it. Um, but this is the passage where God begins to call Moses, and he says, Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of justice. So God is buying back his people from slavery and setting them free. So redeeming the firstborn is another reminder of Israelite identity. In the command to buy back the firstborn sons, God is saying to the people, remember that I set you free. Celebrate this by buying back your firstborn sons. And never, never, never forget that you were once slaves. And how do you remember that? You remember that by being intentional about caring for the poor and oppressed. Because they're your people. We read this in Deuteronomy 24. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That is why I command you to do this. So in memory of their slavery, they never harvest their whole crop, but they always intentionally leave part of it behind so that those who are poor can come to the field and gather food. We'll see this later, actually, when we get to the book of Ruth. Ruth is doing this, and, and Boaz is intentionally obeying this command. Also in chapter 15, if any of your people, men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year, you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord God redeemed you. This is why I give you this command today. So because you were slaves, bless you set people free and set them up for success as they go. Um, a, a side note on this is that a lot of things that we're going to read in the Old Testament seem as if they are endorsing slavery, which can be really confusing from our cultural perspective. And we don't have time to go into that in detail right now. There's a few notes on that, again, also in the emails if you're getting them. But one thing that I, I wanted to bring out is a, a, another verse from Deuteronomy that is a really interesting counterpoint and I think reveals how God really feels about slavery in spite of his willingness to tolerate it among his people for so long. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. Let them live among you wherever they like and when, in whatever town they choose. Do not oppress them. So Israel is actually be a safe haven for runaway slaves. And this is part of the command to never forget that when you see the poor, when you see the oppressed, when you see the defenseless, look at them and say to yourself, that's me. That one is me. When you see the downtrodden, look at them and say, those are my people and care for them as your own. So this last piece, uh, the identity piece from the redemption of the firstborn, the poor are your people. Care for them makes me remember a friend uh, used to go to this church many years ago who had been through it's a really, really hard time and um, watched, had lost his mom at a much too young age, um, struggled financially, um, just been through really awful things. And, it, and I remember him telling me, you know, when I see the poor, when I see the hungry, when I see those who are displaced, I see myself in them. 
you know, and, and I want to work, I want to work with them and for them to make life better for them because I identify with them. You know, they, so many people have been through so many worse things than I've been through. And yet when I see them, it touches something in me and I find myself thinking, those are my people. That's what he said. I find myself thinking, those are my people. Um, and as followers of Jesus, according to the scriptures, we too were once slaves. We were slaves to sin, slaves to fear, slaves to uh, Satan, the, the, the power that is beyond, behind those things. And through the sacrifice of God's son, this evil power has been broken and we've been set free. And we live under the same call. We live under the same call to identify with the poor and with the broken and to look out and to see those people and to say, those are my people. That one is me. I'm going to take care of them the way I would want to be taken care of. The, the last festival we're going to look at is the, the Festival of Tabernacles, sometimes called the, the Feast of Booths. Um, and this one is actually commanded later. This one is commanded in the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's Festival of Tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. On the first day, you are to take branches from luxurious, luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in such shelters so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So remember that God gave you a home and celebrate by living in temporary shelters. This is, a, this is a thing that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. I actually had just never ever paid attention to this holiday at all in my, in my entire life. I'd, you know, you'd read about it every once in a while and wonder, what is that? Um, but I actually for many years had a rabbi for a neighbor and they did celebrate this you know, really faithfully. And so they did in fact, you know, every year build a, a shelter out of branches in their backyard and hang out in it for a week. And it was pr actually pretty fun. So they would invite us over so they, you knew they were going to be there all day. So you could just go anytime. So just be, yeah, anytime this week. Like, like, well, what time do you want us to come? Like, anytime. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 4 o'clock, 9 a.m., 5 p.m. Like, we're there. We're hanging out in, in, our, in our backyard shelter, you know, for, for that whole week. And people would come by and talk and bring food and they would eat and it's a, it's a wonderful celebration. But it's not meant to just be a party. It also comes with a message about identity. Exodus 23, 9 says, Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. And later in Leviticus 19, the foreigners residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. Why? Because you were foreigners in Egypt. So never, never, never forget that you were once foreigners. You were immigrants. I settled you in a land that was not your own, not because you deserved it, but just because I loved you. And because of this, there's a call. Identify with the immigrants. Immigrants are your people. Welcome them, always. So when you see the immigrant, when you see the refugee, when you see the homeless, when you see the orphan, God says to us, look at that person and say, that one is me. Those are my people. And find a way to bless them. Find a way to make them welcome. Find a way to make them at home. You know, my, my one example that I always go back to when I, when I think about this kind of love and blessing and how to, how to apply this verse. Um, Jamie and I, for many years, ran a recovery program for uh, homeless people coming off the streets. And we had one homeless guy who lived with us for many years 
And once he was living inside and had a little bit of regular income, he was constantly go and get change so that he would have a pile of quarters with him every single time he left the house. He never left the house without this pile of quarters because if he saw anyone outside, he would give them 50 cents. He had, didn't have very much, but if he saw anyone begging for money on the street, he wanted to be able to give them 50 cents and he never wanted to leave the house with the chance possibility that now that he had something to call his own, he wouldn't be able to give to one of his old friends or a stranger. And, and it's funny because, you know, he was an alcoholic. He knew full well what those people were going to spend the money on. He knew what he spent the money on. And yet, because he'd been there and he knew what it felt like to be alone, he knew what it felt like to be cold. He knew what it felt like to be out on the street. He didn't seem to think that was important. And so he's kind of always been my example. Like, well, if he's been there and he's done that and he thinks this is good, then I want to do that too. Um, he's looking at those people and saying, those are my people. I remember that. I want to bless them. And we receive the same message from from God as Christians in the New Testament. When God first chose a people, it wasn't us. It was the nation of Israel. And yet, we've been adopted into God's family. We're going to look at Ephesians 2 again. Oh, or maybe we're not. I don't know where it is. It disappeared. If it comes back up, great. If it doesn't, I'm going to read it to you. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, you were outsiders. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel. We are immigrants to the family of God. We have no legal right to be here in this family. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. This recalls the exile, the original exile, the exile from the garden when human beings were cast out from God's presence so that really all of us are displaced people. We are every single one of us far from our natural home. We are far from our father's house with no way on our own to get back. Verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so this same message that was given to Israel applies to us. Never forget that you were on the outside. Never forget that you were the foreigner, that you were the alone person, that you were the outsider, and that you've been adopted into the family of God and gifted with God's presence and promised an eternal home. So when you see the immigrant, when you see anyone who's far from home or alone in the world, I want you to look and say to yourself, that's me. And when you see those who are far from God, those who are lost, those who are doing everything wrong and don't know what, you're, what they're doing, look at them and say, those are my people, and love them as your own. And when God brought Israel out of Egypt, and he made them into a new people, he taught them to identify with the poor and the lost and the broken. And of course, that turned out to be only the beginning, right? Now he's calling anyone who's, who would like to come out of slavery Anyone who wants to come out of our sin, who wants to come out of our fear, who wants to be free from death. And he's setting us free. And he's making us into a new people who will never forget where we've come from and how greatly we've been blessed. He's making us into a people who are always looking back to see who's still lost, to see who is still suffering, to see who we can love and who we can serve and to invite more people on the journey with us. Um, I want to just take some time to pray over us, just that, that God will work these truths in our hearts in whatever way he wants to do so. So I um, just want to invite everyone to stand where you are. I'm going to hit the lights, and Audrey, if you want to come back up. 
You know, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, God is inviting you to be part of his family. <laughs> We'd love to set you free from anything that holds you back. And do new things in your life that you would never have imagined. Um, and and if, if that sounds good to you, you could actually just take this moment right now to say, God, that's something that I would want. I, I want that in my life. I, I don't even know what it is yet, but it sounds good. I'd like to be part of it. For the rest of us, I'd like us just to take a minute to remember. Remember where we've come from. To repent wherever it is that we might have forgotten where we've come from. How much we need God. How much we depend on his grace. And also just want to ask him to renew our hearts and to open our eyes. Um, empower us to engage the people who are around us in the ways that he's calling us to do so. So Lord, we just invite your presence right now. Would you come and would you be at work in our hearts? Come and meet us, Lord. Never let us forget where we came from. Remind us of your amazing grace in our lives. Would you come and be at work in us once again? And would you show us who you want us to be and how you want us to live in this world? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to take uh, just a moment to worship together. So just continue to engage God's presence. We're going to sing a song of worship. And after that, there will be an opportunity to receive prayer. And we'll close the service.